According to a Grand Canyon primer by Ullman, the Grand Canyon is an ancient landscape of time and erosion. Its nearly two billion year geologic history was created in a relatively short span of time. With opposing rims of varying elevations, this mile deep chasm is like no other canyon on the planet. Since this is about a two day drive from where we live here in Texas, I decided to take a road trip out to the Grand Canyon in the summer of 2018. Um, this is one of my first views of the Grand Canyon. You get it when you step out of the village onto the south rim. And everybody always says it, and I really do mean it when I say pictures just don't do it justice. If you ever get a chance to go to the Grand Canyon, you really should go. It's beautiful. So going back to the quote, the walls of the Grand Canyon actually have about two billion years worth of evidence to help show that life has been here on the planet for a very long time. And the book describes this kind of like it's a layer cake, and each layer has different life forms that are present within it. Some of the land, or some of the layers, this is the Coconina uh, form or Coconina sandstone, and you can find that all the way through California, and there are tons of fossils in this layer that show us what life was like back when that layer had been on the top when it was first formed um, back during the Permian period. So with that, Let's do a little bit about fossils and how fossils can form um, and the importance of fossils. This is one of my favorite fossils of all time and it was discovered back in 2011. It's a notosaur. Um, the story behind it was that this dinosaur, either male or female, um, I don't know what sex it is, but she had died and kind of rolled off into a river and then sunk to the bottom. And then eventually sediment filled her in and just exquisite detail on the external of the body. And so you can see the scales and you can see the eyes and it's really a beautiful fossil. Um, what this fossil shows us is what life used to look like, at least for this critter, about 110 million years ago. And so that's one of the beautiful things about fossils, especially when they're well formed, is you can see some really good clarity when you see some really good fossils. Um, fossils also show us some things that used to be alive that are not alive anymore today, so extinct critters. This is a raw isuchid from the Triassic period, and we came across this as we were at uh, Petrified Forest National Park. They have a display area in a museum where they talk about some of the things that had been alive back when Petrified Forest was an actual forest. And so this is just one of the things that they had there. Um, this existed before the stuff that you guys would be familiar with from Jurassic Park, so before T-Rexes and Velociraptors. This was one of the top predators on land back during that period. Um, another really good thing that fossils show us is that life on the planet has changed and the planet itself, the climate has changed in different places. So going back to Petrified Forest, the petrified wood shows us that this used to be a nice swampy pine forest sort of a situation. And this is what it looks like today. Very different. So clearly we were going to have different forms of life back when this was a forest than we have running around there right now. So if the planet can change over time, then it should stand to reason that the creatures that live on that planet are going to be able to change over time as well. Um, there's different kinds of fossils that can end up forming, and one of my favorite ones is intact preservation. Going back to Jurassic Park the movie, there was a scene in the original one where they were extracting DNA from some mosquito thing that was trapped in amber. That's intact preservation. That's a whole bug that is trapped inside the amber or resin from a tree, and you can see like it had compound eyes, you could see that it had antennas, you could count the number of legs and the wings that were on it. This allows you really good detail for something. The problem is that it's really hard to find a fossil that was preserved intact like this, and there's always going to be some distortion whenever something gets trapped in amber because it's sticky and it's going to be struggling for life for a while, and so it's going to get bent out of shape. But when you can find them, you can still see a lot about the critters that lived back at that time. Um, sometimes things, when they die, they get smushed between layers of sediment that are coming down from whatever river happens to be nearby or stream. Um, if it gets smushed in there and then it gets hollowed out, then that's a compression fossil. So this is a leaf from a 260 million year old seed fern. If that impressed or indented area ends up getting filled back in with sediment from the surrounding water, then that's going to leave um, a cast fossil. If you walk around in our area, you can find a whole bunch of fossils of ammonites, and those ammonites are cast fossils that resulted from usually in our area limestone and calcium carbonate filling in that mold that had been created when the original compression fossil formed. Um, another type of impression fossil is sometimes things leave tracks for them, not the organism themselves, but you can see where they walk. So if you go to Dinosaur Valley State Park over in Glenrose, 
you can find imprints from a couple of different types of dinosaurs. This is a theropod, um, and he was walking around, and what you can deduce from this is that they walked on two legs, it seemed like, for the most part. You could see about how long their stride happened to be. So you can't tell a lot, but there are some things that this kind of uh, fossil can show us. Um, Petrifaction or petrification, whichever way you want to say that one. What happens here is minerals go in and it fills up where the organic matter used to be inside of the organism, and so it kind of turns the organism into a rock. And so all of that petrified wood from petrified forests, that results from petrification. All right, so some of the drawbacks to the fossil record, because it's by no means perfect, um, it's incomplete. There's a whole bunch of things that have been on this planet that we have no fossils of because they didn't happen to fossilize. Um, anything that is soft-bodied, and so I'm showing you this moth as an example. Like, what are the chances that this moth right here dies and then ends up becoming a fossil later on? And it's so slim, because think about it. What happens to any moth that dies in today's day and age? Something's going to eat it pretty much immediately, like a mockingbird or a larger bird or some cat or something. The chance that it falls into a place where there's sediment that's going to come in and start to either compress the body or fill it with minerals, it's so slim. And so there are a slew of things that have walked this planet that we're never going to know about because they didn't happen to fossilize. Sometimes the act of fossilization, um, it changes the way the body looked because geological processes are rough. There's a lot of pressure that's going on down there and so it can bend bones and make things look a little bit different. Um, the chance that something fossilizes and then we find it after the fact, that's also fairly slim. So it has a lot of good information for us, but there's a lot of information that's missing just because the fossil record's always going to be incomplete. In terms of determining the age of a fossil, I'm only going to talk about two methods. There are other methods in this, but these are the two that I'm going to hit on. Absolute dating uses radioisotopes, and the type that I'm going to talk about with you is using carbon-14. So carbon-12 is regular, basic, everyday carbon. Carbon-14 is a different form of carbon that's not stable, and so it spontaneously decays. Um, all living organisms need carbon, so they bring it in somehow. Photosynthesizers bring it in through carbon dioxide so that they can incorporate it into molecules in their body. We consume those photosynthesizers or other animals, so we bring carbon in when we eat. So there's a set amount of both carbon-12 and carbon-14, there's a set ratio of that that you're bringing into your body whenever you're consuming your food. The second you die, you stop bringing in that carbon because you're not eating anymore, hopefully, unless you're a zombie, but that's a whole other story. Um, as a result of that, the amount of carbon-12 in your body is going to stay fairly constant, but the amount of carbon-14 is going to decrease over time because it's unstable and it decays. So what we can do is, when we find something that we think is like 20,000 years old or younger, we can look at the ratio between carbon-12 and carbon-14 and then age something based on that ratio that we get. So for example, carbon-14 has a half-life of about 5,700 years. So if you were to die today, when we find your body 5,700 years from now, you would have half the amount of carbon-14 in your body that you had at the moment of your death. So. An example to show us how that works. This is Oatsy the Iceman. He was discovered back in 1991 by some hikers. Um, he was found towards the top of a mountain, so the snow and the ice was starting to melt and his body came out of that snow and ice. Um, we've been doing a lot of research on him. When they first found him, they thought he was maybe 400 years old. One of the things that they did with him was carbon-14 datum, and what they discovered was that he had just over 50% the amount of carbon-14 that you would expect to find from a modern person. And so based on that information, how old do you think he is? Do you think he's the 400 year olds that they thought he was? Do you think he's about 5,000 years old, 10,000 years old, or a million years old? Well, to help you answer that question, let's come back to he had just over 50% the amount of carbon-14 that you would expect. So 50% means one half-life, and one half-life for carbon-14 is 5,700 years. So that means He's about 5,000-ish, because they he had over 50%, so he's about 5,000-ish years old. And so B is the correct answer to that. And that little squiggly just means about 5,000 years old. So he was way older than they thought he was at first. Um, they've done a ton of research on him at this point. Like, they know what his last meal was. He ate some elk. They know what killed him. Somebody shot him with some arrows. They've CT scanned him. They've MRI'd him. They've done a bunch of stuff because that's a pretty old body that we have found 
and we found it where he died. We don't think anybody carried him up there. We think this is just where he collapsed from the arrow wounds and he died at the top of the mountain and then we found him later on. So that's one of the things carbon-14 dating can do for us is it can give us a more accurate picture of how old something is. All right, another way you can figure out how old a fossil is is through relative dating. And this is going to take us back to the Grand Canyon. If you think of it like it's a layer cake, each layer is a certain age. And so some of the oldest rocks in the Grand Canyon are 1.8 billion years old, or 1,840 million years old, if you prefer. If you were to find a fossil in that rock, that would mean that if the rock is this old, the fossil is probably that old as well. This isn't as accurate as absolute dating, but it can give you a roundabout idea how old something is, and it can help, like if you got a good carbon-14 date, and it matched up with the relative date, that's two pieces of evidence that you have supporting how old you believe your fossil is. So going back to this particular layer at the Grand Canyon that was again about 1.8 billion years old, we do have fossils of life from that time period and they are all of some of the simplest organisms that we have ever found. They are called prokaryotic cells, which are those simple cells that don't have a nucleus. All right, so the two billion years of life at the Grand Canyon. It doesn't go up too recent. It in fact stops in the Mesozoic period, so there's nothing from the Cenozoic period or more recent than that. Well, we are in the Cenozoic period, although we could argue about that for a bit. The older layers are down here at the bottom where the Colorado River is, and then it gets younger as you get farther and farther up. So one of the things that you will hopefully notice during the rest of this video is that down in the older layers, we get very simple life forms that are made out of very simple cells that don't even have a nucleus. And as you progress upwards, the cells get more complex, the organisms get more complex, you start to get things that you're a little bit more familiar with. And so we can pretty clearly see things are changing over time as you go from the bottom up towards the younger areas of the Grand Canyon. All right, so some of the earliest forms of life. I showed you a fossil of this a minute ago. These are stromatolites, and it doesn't look like very much, but what was happening is in each one of these layers, we get lots of little prokaryotic cells. Um, some of them were photosynthetic, so they were like plants that they could do photosynthesis, except their cells are completely different. They're single-celled, they're not multi-celled, so this is the simplest forms of life, and they also happen to be the oldest fossils we have. So the oldest fossils are from about three and a half billion years ago. Um, these guys are even still alive to this day, and so this also shows you that once life finds a way to live really well, it doesn't have to necessarily change a whole heck of a lot. And so we still have stromatolites off the coast of Australia, and the oldest forms of life are also stromatolites. Hmm. All right, one of the things that those stromatolites did being photosynthetic, early Earth did not have very much oxygen present in the atmosphere, and those photosynthetic organisms added oxygen to the atmosphere. So oxygen's great for you, you absolutely need it for survival, but as it turns out, a lot of the things that were alive back then oxygen was poisonous to those things. And so the success of the stromatolites meant a bunch of other things had to die because they literally poisoned them with the gases that they were pumping out. That oxygen availability though means we can start to make some things a little bit more complex because we're gonna be able to harness more energy from the foods that we eat if we have oxygen available to us. So once we get those prokaryotic cells and we get an influx of oxygen, we can start to get eukaryotic cells. Now eukaryotic cells are more complex. They have a nucleus. They have other membrane-bound organelles like rough ER and smooth ER. These are some of the earlier fossils that we have, and it's, again, more complex than those prokaryotes from a second ago, but this really doesn't look like life as you guys know it today either for the most part. So we're gonna get even more advanced from those. Now, where the prokaryotic fossils went back to three and a half billion years ago, it took at least a billion years, and some estimates say two billion years, to get us over to eukaryotic organisms. There's a lot of debate about how long that really took, but at least a billion years before we could get to the eukaryotic organisms in the fossil record. So how did eukaryotic cells form from prokaryotic cells? Uh, the book describes something known as the endosymbiont hypothesis. So some of the more complicated organelles that are present in eukaryotic cells are mitochondria and then chloroplasts. Now what makes these organelles a little bit more complex is they have two membranes around them, not just one. So imagine that one cell decided that it was going to try to move in and live in this cell. 
that cell would have its own original membrane and then when it came in to live in this cell, it would pick up the membrane from around this cell. So that's one piece of evidence to say perhaps these things started outside of cells as their own separate prokaryotic things and then they moved into a larger cell. Other pieces of evidence, they have their own single circular DNA that is separate from the DNA inside the nucleus of a typical eukaryotic cell. They have their own ribosomes that are different from the other ribosomes that are present in the cytoplasm of the rest of the cell. So there's a, a fair amount of evidence. It's up for you whether or not you want to go with that evidence and believe that these organelles started out as other forms of life. But to me, that evidence is pretty compelling to say eukaryotic cells became more complex because they started to use smaller prokaryotic cells to their advantage. If they picked up these guys, well, now they'd be able to do photosynthesis. And that's a clear advantage because you can use sunlight to help power your reactions. And if you pick up this little guy, that means you're going to be able to make some more ATP. And so both of these organelles are advantageous if you can bring them into your cells. All right, so now what we're going to do is kind of run through the geologic time scale. And we're going to look at this as we can from the Grand Canyon and through the fossil record over time. Um, the Cambrian period was about 541 to 485 million years ago. Earth was just starting to come out of a pretty severe ice age. Um, what we find at this time is we do have a lot of the animal phyla that we even still have today, but the critters that were around at that time were more simple. So this is a trilobite off over here, which there's the word so you can see what it is. Um, plants tended to be fairly small, they didn't have vascular tissue, they didn't produce seeds, they didn't produce flowers. And so the, the life that we had from fossil records of rocks dated at this time, it shows us that life was still fairly simple back during the Cambrian period, but there was a huge explosion of life that's sometimes called the Cambrian explosion. So life was really getting going during the Cambrian period. All right, next step, the Ordovician period. You can see the time frame up there in the top part. At this stage, plants moved out of the water, which the earth was mostly water before this, and then onto land. Uh, we started to get fish, which are vertebrate animals, so that's a more complex organism than what we had before. And then we're starting to get some coral. Now, coral are fairly simple animals, but coral are important for building coral reefs. And reefs are these wonderful nurseries for a whole bunch of other things, including fish. And so the fact that these two things go together, it's probably relevant. Um, now, notice what I say right here. There is not a layer of rock from the Grand Canyon for this particular time period. It's possible that the layer formed and then eroded pretty quickly after it was uh, set up, or it's possible that sediment just didn't form in this area during this time period. Whenever there's a layer that's missing from a certain spot, that's called an unconformity. The Grand Canyon has a big unconformity called the Great Unconformity that was before the Cambrian period. This is one of the lesser or smaller unconformities that happened. So this period and the Silurian period were both just missing from the Grand Canyon. But going for other layers and other places, after the Ordovician period came the Silurian period. Now plants are starting to get vascular tissue and what that means is they can start to move water up their body and then nutrients from their leaves to their roots and that means they're going to be able to get bigger. And so we're going to start to be able to get shrubs and trees once we get vascular tissue. Uh, marine invertebrates, that includes things like octopus and squid and the one that I'm showing you here in the fossil record, this is a very primitive little sea star off over here. Also, very importantly, animals moved up onto land. So notice plants moved up first, animals followed, and that really should make sense because animals tend to need to eat things and plants were what we started to eat at first. After that, the Devonian period is once again represented in the Grand Canyon. So this is the Temple Butte limestone. It's 385 million years old, which you can see is within this period. Um, we do start to get trees. Again, we had to get the vascular tissue first, but now our plants can get to be really tall. We also start to pick up seeds, and seeds are going to allow plants to distribute their offspring and allow them to get a little bit farther away and protect the embryos, and so that's an advantage for plants. Um, terrestrial tetrapods, so the land animals that came first were things like snails. Now what we're getting are things that are, if you kind of think of them sort of like salamanders, that's what you're starting to get in the fossil record. So tetrapod means four-limbed. So they've got basically two arms and two legs. They're going to be able to walk around on land. And so we're starting to see fossils of that starting to develop during the Devonian period. Next, the Carboniferous period. 
Um, this one we have a conglomerate rock from the Grand Canyon and conglomerate is when a bunch of different rocks kind of mix together and then get compressed together. Um, lycophyte trees, they're sort of like fern trees if you want to look at them that way. Um, all of the huge trees end up producing so much oxygen that all of the other animals start to get really large, especially the arthropods. And so this is just to show you a dragonfly and then she's here to show you how big that dragonfly would be relative to us, which there were no people at this point, but that's a huge dragonfly. Um, and that was because of the oxygen that was available. Amphibians are frogs and salamanders and reptiles would be things like turtles and snakes and they're starting to become more advanced. Their ears are starting to get more well developed so they can hear things better. Um, things are just starting to move up in terms of complexity. Next, the Permian period is the last period within the Paleozoic era. Um, the Toro Weep sandstone is 273 million years old, which is towards the beginning-ish of the Permian period. Um, this is when Pangaea forms, which is when all of the continents or all of the land masses on Earth merged together, and then we had one giant ocean that surrounded all of those things. Conifers are trees, like if you think of a typical Christmas tree or a pine tree, those are conifers. And so those are more advanced than the lycophytes because they're protecting the seeds within pine cones or other cones. Um, insects are also really flourishing during this period. So there's another dragonfly that came from the Permian period off down there. Um, incidentally, the Permian period should sound a little bit familiar because of the Permian Basin here in Texas. So you can find a lot of fossils from this period if you go out to the Permian Basin. All right, next up we are entering the Mesozoic era and the first period in this era is the Triassic period. Um, in between the Permian period and the Triassic period, there is a huge mass extinction. And anytime there's a mass extinction, what that means is there are a bunch of niches or habitats that can be filled by things because the things that used to fill them, they're dead now. And so new things can move in and that tends to lead to an event that's called an adaptive radiation. So imagine that like one little lizardy type thing moves in here and then that lizardy thing can be the top predator because the top predator from the previous time period is dead well now we can evolve that into multiple different types of top predators and that's pretty much what happened here because voila we have dinosaurs now where there were no dinosaurs in the permian period we get pterosaurs think pterodactyl and then mammals first popped up during this period here um, as I said off over here, we don't get to Grand Canyon-y stuff for this layer or above. All right, Jurassic period. Everybody always thinks Jurassic Park for this, but a lot of the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park did not come from this period. There were dinosaurs here, but it's just not the ones you typically think of from the film. Um, the ammonites that we find around here, they tend to be from the Jurassic period. The dinosaurs, and this is kind of a crocodilian one, and crocodiles haven't changed a whole heck of a lot since the Jurassic period. They're a very prehistoric form of life. This is a beautifully preserved pine cone from the period. So this goes back to the gymnosperm and the conifer off over there, and then there's still a bunch of ferns. Notice what else I say. There's no flowering plants that are present at this point. That means no grass, no wheat, no rice no flowering trees like oak trees none of those things are around everything is a more primitive type of plant at this point cretaceous period this is where you get the dinosaurs that jurassic park tends to like to show you including the triceratops that this is a fossil of right here this is where flowering plants start to appear and so this is when you do start to get some of those flowers like magnolia flowers or um, grasses are actually flowering plants although their flowers aren't all that showy uh, dinosaurs were still having a lovely time during this period. Um, just a little side note, sharks pick up during this time period. And at the end of this, the hypothesis is a giant meteor crashed into the earth, kind of near the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Um, it threw out this huge layer of dust that included a bunch of iridium, which is an element that you tend to get from meteors. And that iridium settled all over the entire surface of the earth. So if there's iridium floating around, that means the atmosphere is going to be really dusty and cloudy, and so that's probably going to cool things off. And so the hypothesis is the dinosaurs died off because of that meteor crashing into Earth. Not everything died, though, or we would not be here today. So mammals did just fine after this period. Birds did just fine after this period, and a bunch of other things did fine, too. But the dinosaurs, not a single dinosaur survived past the Cretaceous period. All right. 
Cenozoic era is divided into a few different periods, but different books give you different period names, so I'm not going to hold you responsible for the periods here. Um, this is where mammals have an adaptive radiation, because once again, the dinosaurs are all gone, mammals can start to move into those new niches. Insects like ants and bees start to do really well, and then birds have an adaptive radiation as well. Um, fairly recently, modern humans evolved, and then grasslands, because you had to have angiosperms where you could get grasses, and so when you think of like typical where we live here in Texas, this is a relatively new thing in terms of geologic time scale. Um, the bison that you see here, also fairly new to the fossil record, and so Cenozoic area, era is where we live right now, and it's a blink of the eye in terms of geologic time. All right, another thing that we found while we were traipsing about on our road trip was in Arizona, it's a place called Meteor Crater, which is privately owned. Um, what happened at this crater was about 50,000 years ago, which is during the Cenozoic era, a fairly large meteor came crashing into Earth, and it left this four kilometer um, wide crater in Arizona. Um, fossils from 50,000 years ago, um, let's see, let me get to the last slide, show that the things that were around were the things from like the Ice Age movie, which is why I did that Ice Age anyone thing. So we had the giant ground sloths and we had the woolly mammoths, there were bison, and yes, there were camels here in America. Camels actually originated here in North America, and then they traveled elsewhere after that. Um, the reason why I wanted to hit Meteor Crater with you guys is to show you that, once again, sometimes things happen and the planet changes because of some outside event. So woolly mammoths don't exist here in this area because the Ice Age has taken all of the cold weather that they relied on here in this area. But this crater would have killed a fair number of animals after it hit right in this one spot. Um, this meteor apparently was not as big as the one that caused the extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period which kind of shows you how big that other meteor must have been to wipe out all of the dinosaurs off the face of the earth because this is a very large crater and I know it doesn't look like it from the pictures it's another one of those things that you kind of have to be standing on the edge of to appreciate how large it is down here I think it's right about there in that picture they actually have a little astronaut suit set up and it's so tiny you can't see it from here but the reason they did that is because they would send astronauts to this meteor so that they could learn how to walk on the moon. That's how weird and desolate this little place is. So I hope that this gives you an idea of the earth changes over time, the climate changes over time, and as those two things change, the animals, plants, and fungi that live in those areas have to adapt to the new environment that comes into it. And so things have to change because the planet's changing and if you don't, you die. Hope you enjoyed that little video and I hope you get the chance to go see either Meteor Crater or Petrified Forest or the Grand Canyon. It really makes for a fun road trip. Bye!